Well, that reading, if you look at the very last verse, ended on something of a stomach-turning note, didn't it? This central chapter is full of strong language as Peter addresses a sobering reality. It's full of hard things for us to hear and for him to say. I wonder how good are you at hearing and saying hard things? Are you a conflict addict, skilled at playing devil's advocate without any encouragement? Or are you conflict averse, someone who loves to bring the temperature down, make sure that nothing ever gets out of hand? One of the joys of being in a CU is enjoying the team God has given you from all sorts of different churches and backgrounds and with all sorts of different personalities. Perhaps you can already imagine in your head who in your CU is a conflict addict, who in your CU is conflict averse, and it's great to have that difference. But one of the dangers is that we can baptize one of those personality types as the godly ideal. So then the conflict addict becomes valiant for truth, the one who's sound and prepared to stand for the gospel when everyone else gives way. Or the conflict averse becomes the peacemaker, the one who values love. And didn't Jesus say, blessed are the peacemakers? But Jesus won't let us get away with those caricatures. You see, Jesus' gentleness made him a magnet for broken, hurting people. And let's pray our CUs are like that. Let's pray that's what people find in us this year. And at the same time, Jesus' courage meant that he spoke the truth, even when it cost him, even when it cost him everything. And let's pray that this year, we would have that courage too. And my prayer has been, as we come to this chapter, that the Holy Spirit would work through these words in us to form us to be more like Jesus. We need this chapter. In it, Peter is sounding a warning about false teaching in the church. And he's not going off on his personal hobby horse. This is all over the New Testament. A letter like Jude covers very similar ground. And in it, Peter is telling us about a threat we need to face up to. And if we're conflict averse, which British culture as a whole tends to be, this is quite uncomfortable reading. For one thing, Peter doesn't just spell out the solutions and tell us the positives. To be honest, if you had read, understood, and applied chapter one, you would never have a problem with false teachers or false teaching. But Peter can't leave it at chapter one with its encouragements and exhortations. He has to give us chapter two. He has to unmask the threat. Why? Because Peter can't fall short of his master. In his first letter, chapter five, Peter tells us that the church is the flock of God and all of its leaders, all of its Peters are just under shepherds of Jesus, the chief shepherd. It's their role to warn the flock about the wolves. Wolves that Jesus said would come, Matthew's gospel, dressed as sheep. So this morning, Peter's gonna tell us about the threat and then give us two ways to respond. First, the threat, and this is my first big point. False teachers are a reality we can't ignore, downplay, or accept. False teachers are a reality we can't ignore, downplay, or accept. Have a look at verse one. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Peter finished chapter one talking about prophets who spoke from God, and that was a reality in the Old Testament but so were false prophets. And in exactly the same way, he says, there will be false teachers in the church today. They will sneak in destructive teaching. They'll deny Jesus with fabricated stories and they will drag many down to follow their evil way of life. And we can't ignore this. This is a threat which Jesus said would come people standing over the Bible, redefining what good and evil are, and leading others into evil lifestyles. We can't ignore this threat, we can't afford to, and we can't downplay it either. 
I'm so tempted to do this. We see false teaching in action. We see a compromise with sin or a key truth of the gospel denied. And then we try to focus on aspects of the false teacher's life or ministry that look faithful. So tempted to try and downplay what's so toxic, but we can't do that. It's so serious. Have a look at verse 13. They will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They claim a place within God's church, at the Lord's table, at the head of the Lord's table, while denying him with their lifestyles. They're shameless, and they use the time-honored tools of sex, money, and power to do it. We read there that they have eyes full of adultery. They look at the world through that lens of sexual gratification. We read that they are experts in greed. They know how to get rich off their followers, and they love power. They seduce the unstable, Peter says. They get a real kick out of all the people who listen to them and trust them implicitly. And verse 18 is heartbreaking because it turns out that their evil spills out to damage others. Verse 18, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. Just escaping. That describes sinners who hear Jesus calling them, hear him say, deny yourself, take up your cross, come follow me. And just as they're turning to do it, the false teachers put a stumbling block in the way. And they say, no, you don't have to do that. And they call people towards the sin that Jesus says will destroy them. It's awful. And some of us might have seen that happen. People who are so close to starting to follow Jesus, and then they're fatally misled by false teaching, which speaks with Satan's voice from Genesis 3, that old strategy. Did God really say? You will not surely die. And appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people into sin. There are really public examples of this across the pond where you see so-called Christian teachers flying private jets and grabbing money off any of the poor people who listen to them. But in our nation, there are loads of examples of this too. Heartbreaking ones. Churches and church leaders who know what scripture says about marriage because it's so clear. Who know what Jesus has called his people to and what Jesus' people have lived out for centuries and yet are moving away from that. And as they do, are calling people away from life, calling people away from self-denying, cross-bearing, Jesus-following sexuality in singleness or marriage that glorifies him that is so good. And because of false teaching, people who seemed on the cusp of turning to him end up trapped in the sin Jesus warns against. We can't ignore this threat or downplay it or accept it. We can't tolerate it or acclimatize to it because these false teachers are, very vivid image, springs without water, which means they promise much but deliver nothing. They are the ultimate disappointment to any who put their hope in them. And these false teachers are in terrible danger themselves. They are ignorant of of serious issues and headed for destruction. That's what you see in verses 10 to 11. Bold and arrogant, they are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. And it seems that these false teachers were slandering demons. And you might think to yourself, well, no, that, that sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? Demons are the bad guys. That sounds pretty metal, slandering demons. But actually, no. Peter points out that even angels don't do that. Angels are stronger than demons, and they've been sent by God to bring judgment against them. So we definitely shouldn't do that because we're not stronger than demons, and we've not been divinely commissioned to bring judgments. 
Slander is somewhere where the angels fear to tread. So how could we go there? They're so reckless, pretending to be wise. These false teachers are are foolish in the extreme. And that's what we see in verse 12. These people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. And in those verses, we hear that they will perish in the destruction they brought upon others. The reference to Balaam from the book of Numbers drives that home. He made some amazing prophecies to bless God's people, even though he'd been hired to curse them. But in the end, he ended up dying with God's enemies. And in the passage that Peter alludes to, he had to be rebuked by a donkey for all of his wisdom. False teachers are headed for destruction. And these verses are so sobering. Verse 20, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. They've turned their backs on the sacred command. And so their judgment will be severe. And this might make you ask, Were they ever really Christians then? And as you look through these verses, you'll see Peter's not interested in addressing that question. Other parts of scripture do do more of that. So 1 John 2.19, I'll just read it for you, addresses this, I think, helpfully. They, false teachers, went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you see, Peter isn't interested in addressing this question here because he doesn't want any of us to be complacent. You see, all of these false teachers were definitely part of the visible church, if not in the end, the invisible church. And so for all intents and purposes, they looked like they were sharing in the benefits of Christ, looked like they were headed towards the heavenly city and that rich welcome, but then they turned back towards destruction. Just zoom out for a moment and think back to yesterday. No wonder Peter tells us to make every effort for a godly life. Because false teaching and evil living dovetail together. They enable one another. And this morning, it's worth looking into your heart. Because it might just be that some of us are trifling with things we know are sin. Perhaps like so many You're falling for the lies of pornography, which just leaves you hollower than ever until soon. You have eyes full of adultery. You can only see yourself and others through the dehumanizing lens of sexual gratification. Or perhaps as you think about the future, the career you might have, you're giving love of money free reign in your heart, which will make you an expert in greed to the point where Jesus doesn't even look like treasure anymore. Or maybe power really appeals to you. I think this is faintly ridiculous, but I saw it when I was a staff worker. People who love the position of authority that CU leadership and a position on committee would give them. It's slightly ridiculous, but actually it's not funny at all. Because when we chase after power, And when we get it, our pride becomes so inflated, our ego so overblown, that we don't believe Jesus when he tells us the true greatness is serving others. That even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And because we don't believe him, we miss out on glory. Jesus calls us to die to those things, because otherwise we'll die in them. False teachers are a reality we can't ignore, downplay, or accept. And that's because Jesus, the head of the church, cannot, will not ignore, downplay, or accept it. And if we're conflict averse, this is a reality we need to understand. False teaching sets people on a trajectory that takes them to hell. But if you're a conflict addict, and at this point I might as well admit that's me, then this chapter also has to shape and challenge us. Because this chapter is not a license for aggression. This is not your excuse to go John Wick on anyone you think is a false teacher. I'm glad you all like John Wick. I think those films are brilliant. (laughs) This chapter puts the brakes on that instinct, actually, as we see how Peter applies it. There are two very important caveats. 
One, do you notice that this is false teachers in the church? This isn't anyone you see on campus who's living in an ungodly way. It is heartbreaking when we see our friends doing that. But until they come to know Jesus, they have no reason not to, and scripture tells us, no power not to. So see those people with great love and long to reach out to them with the gospel so that they can begin to live, so they were, live the lives they were made for. This is false teachers in the church. On that little tangent, verse 8, Lot is a very interesting example to us. Does sinful living around you break your heart? Or have you become hard to it? Might be good while you're at forum to pray that the Lord would break your heart, to be utterly broken, devastated when you see people living as so much less than what God calls them to be and longs for them to be. That's one caveat. The second caveat is, for most of us in this room, I imagine the majority, you are not an elder or an overseer or a minister or a pastor or a vicar or whatever other title you would use. And so the application to you is not the same as it would be to them. Hands up if you've ever studied or read any of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, or Titus. Wonderful books. Oh, great that you've been in those books. They are fantastic. And if you read them, you'll see that the application is really front foot when it comes to false teaching. And that makes sense, because Timothy and Titus are elders and overseers responsible for training other elders and overseers. Of course the application is front foot. But as we'll see, Peter's application is not like that because he's writing to normal church members like me and you. So his application is quite different, actually. And what you'll see is that you as an individual are not the solution to the false teaching epidemic. God saved you as part of his church. And in your local churches, you have leaders whom he has set apart and given the responsibility to contend for the gospel, call out false teaching, and correct and rebuke false teachers. And as a church member, pray for them to do that. Back them to the hilt when they do that. Encourage them when they teach you sound truth. But unless you are an elder or an overseer or a minister or a pastor or whatever, this is not your responsibility. What is your responsibility? Well, as a CU leader, your responsibility is mapped out by the doctrinal basis, which is a wonderful statement. Richard often says it keeps us as broad as the gospel allows and as narrow as the gospel demands. Don't miss here 2 Peter 2. This is not invective on secondary issues because a Christian in this tent thinks differently from you on an issue that is not gospel. This is about the false teaching that denies gospel truth. And the doctrinal basis is a wonderful way of bringing us together around that gospel truth. Can I plead with you? See the honor that it is to, sh to sign up to that doctrinal basis. It is not just a formality. It's not something you do and then you get to be president. It is a wonderful privilege because as you sign it, you take your stand for Jesus and against false teaching. And you get to line up with decades of people to whom God has been faithful in keeping them faithful. Last night, it was amazing to hear John Lennox talk about the potential in this room. And it's amazing for me to see it. And my prayer for you is that the Lord would protect you and anchor you to the truth of the gospel. Why not pray and strive this year for the truths of the gospel, the truth expressed in the doctrinal basis, to anchor you and your see you? So how do we respond to false teaching? If you're a conflict addict like me, pay attention to this first response. It's our second headline, and here it is. Trust God's track record. He knows what he's doing. That's the application, not to go and get aggressive. Trust God's track record. He knows what he's doing. Verses four to nine are making a really simple point. If X, then Y. If God has done this, then you know he can do that. Follow it along with me. If God did not spare angels, did not spare the ancient world, protected Noah, condemned Sodom and Gomorrah, rescued Lot, if all those things, and it builds to verse 9, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. 
God has a proven track record. That's one of the reasons why we have the Old Testament, to encourage us with true stories of his faithfulness, keeping and securing the godly, even in the face of terrible trials, and bringing judgment to those who deserved it. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. Trust him and apply that to your heartbreak and frustrations now. I feel so much frustration when I see false teaching in the church, particularly in my denomination. And it makes me cry out, why do you let this happen, Lord? Why don't you just get rid of it? Why do you tolerate it? And 2 Peter 2 says to me, trust him, Niv. He knows what he's doing. Apply this to your frustrations. And this is so wonderful. Trust him because he knows how to rescue the godly from trials. He knows how to protect those who are his. He knows how to comfort and secure even those Christians who've been damaged by false teaching and to keep his own. And he knows how to bring judgment. That's something that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah show us. If you look at verse 6, they are an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. In these verses... Peter tells us, and it's something he tells us a lot in this letter, that judgment will come when Jesus returns. That's something many people hate to hear. They can't stand listening to what Jesus has to say about hell. But we need to know this. If God has not set a day for judgment, then he is a lesser being in every way than the person the Bible presents. Less holy, less powerful, less loving. God isn't a teddy bear, and you wouldn't want him to be. A teddy bear God who only comforts and never condemns is not what a broken world needs. A teddy bear God cannot oppose tyrants, put down evil, defend the weak, and bring justice. But praise God, he is not a teddy bear. He does not yawn at atrocities and shrug at evil. He will bring judgment. And that tells us how great God is, how holy. And it tells us how much he values us. I don't know if this ever happened to you. When I was a child and my parents had lots of people around, um, all the adults would sit on one table, the real table, and all the children would sit on the kids' table, and I would sit on the kids' table, and I hated it. I didn't want to be with my cousins who were so boring. I wanted to be with the adults because I wanted to be taken seriously. I wanted them to hear my fascinating insights and laugh at my great jokes, although you haven't really been doing that, have you? (laughs) Sorry, no bitterness. I love you all. But I hated not being at the grown-ups table. I didn't just want to be smiled at for being cute, which I really was. (laughs) There you go. Oh, you're too kind. I wanted to be taken seriously. And the truth that Jesus will come to judge tells us that he does take us seriously. He takes life seriously. He takes how I treat you seriously. And he takes how you treat me seriously. All our ways are known to him and he will bring judgment. And that is a wonderful dignity to have in the sight of God. And that's exactly what the false teachers couldn't stand. In the next chapter, we see what their false teaching actually was. In glance, chapter 3, verse 3, scoffers come following their own evil desires, and we see they're not asking honest questions, they're sneering. And they're sneering at one doctrine in particular, that Jesus will return to judge. They would say, if you told them you believe that, oh, you really take that literally? How unsophisticated, how pre-scientific, do you really But before the sneering gets under your skin, just ask yourself this. What do you gain by taking the truth of God's judgment out of the Christian life? Well, these false teachers want to follow their own evil desires. Take judgment day out of the picture. Get rid of Jesus' return. And who's to stop you living your own way? Who's to stop you doing just as you please? That's often the way. The things we choose to believe make room for how we want to live. Some of you might have read Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. He wrote very honestly in another work about his philosophy. He said, I had motive for not wanting the world to have a meaning. Consequently, I assumed that it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. 
And the false teachers followed the same pattern, just with a lot less honesty. Their denial of Jesus' return made room for their evil living. Do not go there, my friends. Just don't follow their example. Instead, rejoice in the fact that God knows how to rescue the godly, and on the last day, that will be our only hope, to have trusted Jesus. And he knows how to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Trust God's track record. He knows what he's doing. Thirdly and finally, another response. Cling to the freedom of Jesus as master. Cling to the freedom of Jesus as master. This one isn't explicitly commanded, but it's there as the opposite of false teachers. Here's the tragedy of false teaching. Verse one, they deny Jesus as master. I know verse one says Lord, but it's not the normal Lord word. That word is a master of slaves. They deny Jesus. Why? Verse 19, so that they can promise freedom. That's what they do. No master, no king, freedom from the tyranny of Jesus. But of course that never works, does it? Think about the Lion King, the original, not the new one, because the new one doesn't have this scene and makes it a worse film because of it. But, but think about the original. You have Scar telling the hyenas his plan. They're going to kill Mufasa. And Shenzi says, great idea. Who needs a king? And the hyenas begin to sing, no king, no king, la, 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 la. And Scar interrupts them. Idiots, there will be a king. I will be king. And that is how declaring independence from Jesus always ends. We kick him out as king, and we end up enslaved. And Peter wants us to know that is why we cannot let false teaching flourish in our day. We cannot believe it, and we cannot sit under it, because it just enslaves those whom Christ has set free. Verse 19, they promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. The tragedy of addiction shows us that slavery very vividly when you see it in addiction to a bottle or to a phone. But sin deals in the subtler, deeper slavery beneath them all. Slavery to self. George Eliot, the novelist, walked away from her Christian upbringing, but she still knew and feared this slavery, and she wrote this. Will not a tiny speck very close to our vision blot out the glory of the world and leave only a margin by which we see the blot? I know no speck so troublesome as self. This is the slavery that keeps us from life because it keeps us curved in on ourselves and shuts out the life-giving love of Jesus. And it doesn't work. Of course it doesn't, because the pursuit of freedom isn't straightforward. It's a mysterious thing. It's not just about escaping restriction, because there are all sorts of restrictions that when we embrace them, set us free. So if you're sporty, and I thank God that I'm not, but if you are, that's why you give up your freedom to eat whatever you like, laze around all day, in exchange for the better freedom of excelling on the pitch and flourishing as a team. That's why in love, You give up that freedom to play the field and flirt with anyone you like, and you get a much better freedom. The intimacy that comes when you know and commit to another person, and they to you. Take the musical Hamilton. I really love it. The heroes aim to defy British rule. Misguided, we can all agree. But (laughs) it isn't working out for them, is it? Anyway, but, but, oh dear. Note to self, avoid politics. <laughs> Broke that one. Um, but, but in the musical, it's really stirring. The heroes on the eve of battle sing, raise a glass to freedom, something they can never take away, no matter what they tell you. But the musical is actually very wise about freedom. Because when Alexander Hamilton is getting married, all those friends get together again and sing again, drunkenly, raise a glass to freedom, something you will never see again, no matter what she tells you. And it's a joke, but it's also true. Because later, when Alexander Hamilton cheats on his wife and seeks freedom apart from her, everything falls apart. And if you've seen it, you'll know he ends up trapped, blackmailed. Everything in his life dissolves in terms of what could have been. And he only gets freedom through the forgiving love of his wife later on. Pursuing freedom apart from Jesus 
never works. We end up slaves. And it's horrifying, most of all, because it gets Jesus all wrong. What kind of master is Jesus? First one, the sovereign Lord who bought them. How did he buy us? Peter tells us in his first letter, first chapter, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without sin or defect. What kind of master is Jesus? How does he treat his slaves? He dies for them. He becomes weak so they can become strong. He becomes poor so they can become rich. He embraces condemnation so they can walk free. Has there ever been a master like Jesus? Having Jesus as your master isn't being belittled or ground down or dehumanized, is it? He's so good to us, so gentle, so much more committed to our good than we are. The whole Christian life is animated by this paradox. Real freedom isn't found in throwing off the yoke, doing whatever we want. It's found in submitting to the yoke of Jesus because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. His yoke is life in the Father's love. His burden is being a child of God. And so his service is perfect freedom. As I pray, so many of you have a chance to share through Uncover Mark. When Jesus calls people to come and die, it is so that they might live, so that whoever loses their life for him in the gospel will find it. Of course, because we were made for him. So like a caged lion or a beached whale, we won't be free until we're in our element. We won't be free until we're in him. To bow to Jesus is to learn how to stand up straight and walk upright through the world as a slave to no one. That's why we love to sing that hymn, don't we? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound by sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray I woke the dungeon filled with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. The Christian life begins in liberation, and it's meant to continue like that as we get freer and freer, as we are closer and closer to Jesus. Cling to the freedom of Jesus as master. Don't let anyone rob you of that freedom. Don't let anyone entice you to compromise with sin. A compromise that will not come in an overt and aggressive way, but usually in a very nice seeming way. Don't let it happen. Don't let anyone rob you of this freedom. Cling to the freedom of Jesus as master. Let's finish by thinking about that vision in Revelation 4. I'm sure you know it. It's a vision of heaven as the 24 elders are seated in thrones around the throne of Jesus. And they're casting down their crowns as they praise him. And the false teachers will sidle up to us and say, that's a bit much, isn't it? Jesus always making you bow and scrape. And the gospel comes to them and says, you fools, who put them on thrones? Who gave them those crowns? This is the life-giving paradox. The most royal we can ever be is to submit ourselves to Jesus. Because when we do, it's not that he crushes us or puts the chains on. He puts a crown on us. He enthrones us as his very own. False teaching is a reality we cannot ignore, downplay, or accept. Don't let any compromise creep in to your walk with Jesus. Instead, Trust God's track record. He knows what he's doing and claims the freedom of Jesus as master. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, there are hard words that you have spoken through your spirit as your servant Peter wrote in this chapter. And I pray that you would give us softness of heart. Cause us, Lord, to tremble when we consider how sobering and serious and awesome are these realities that we are thinking about. Cause us to tremble at the thought of moving away from you by denying you in the way we live or in what we believe. But please, Lord, make us those who have tender hearts and a backbone of steel when it comes to the gospel. Please, Lord, enable us to trust you with what you're doing. Trust you with those we are afraid for who are threatened by false teaching. Trust you with the false teachers themselves. 
Thank you that we can trust you, that you know what you're doing. And above all, Lord, I pray that we might cling to the freedom of having Jesus as our master. Please don't let any of us be led astray by the lies. Please don't let any of us be called back to the sin that will only destroy. Soften our hearts to see how wonderful and free we are in you. Free indeed. We thank you for that freedom. Please, Lord God, protect each one of us in that freedom. In your name. Amen.